They're desperate. They have little choice. They're escaping from war, persecution, and even the effects of climate change. In search of a better life, they are taking up dangerous journeys. Their hope is to find a more promising future. However, this hope often leads to crowded refugee camps, as we've recently seen in Lampedusa, where an increasing number of refugees endure harsh and inhumane conditions. A similar situation unfolds at the US-Mexico border, where many face the grim reality of not being recognized as asylum seekers. The host countries appear overwhelmed and are increasingly showing a harder stance in their approach. Even the most expensive deals are not able to stop the tide of illegal immigration. So on to the point, we are asking, global migration crisis, what solutions do politicians have? Hello and welcome to To The Point. I'm Isha Bhatia Sanan here in Berlin. To understand how governments around the world are trying to tackle the issue of illegal migration, I have three spectacular guests with me today. We have Karolina Vigura. She is political editor of Cultura Liberalna, Poland's leading online political and cultural weekly. Next on the panel is John Kampfner. He is a British author, broadcaster and executive director at Chatham House, a think tank headquartered in London. And joining us from London is John Dalhusen. He is a senior fellow at the European Stability Initiative, ESI, and is working on EU migration policy. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining. Carolina, Lampedusa has been in news all week, but also New York. Now, more than 100,000 migrants have arrived there since the spring of 2022. What's going on? Why is there this uh, influx into Europe and US? Is there an explanation to this? I think we are right in the midst of a migration epoch. This is certainly the heart of our challenges that we are facing right now. Now, the, the, the reasons for this are, of course, complicated. As with every great phenomenon, this also has a lot of various reasons, but I would name a couple of them. So first, of course, the climate change. This is the first thing. The second thing is how the politics in Africa, in the Asian countries, uh, look like and the situation that the, situ the, that the societies are in. This is the second. The third one is that it seems that international mafias are also very much interested in smuggling those people. So they are, so to say, making money, uh, an enormous amounts of money on this. And last but not least, the social media. Because now on each and every one's smartphone, we can see what the life looks like in Australia, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada. And this is what those people see on their smartphones. So if the life looks so well in those countries, why not, why not go and change everything? John Kampfner, going by so many reasons, is it time to reconsider the refugee policies that are existent? The question is, who does that and, and how is it done uh, here in, in Berlin, in the heart of Europe? Is this done at national level? Is this done uh, at European level? And what we have is endless month-on-month -month tactical shifts, crisis management by governments here and, and, and elsewhere. What we do not have is a strategy for migration, nor alongside it, concomitant to it, do we have a strategy for demography either. So we have the paradox that in Europe, in order to sustain our public services with, in most countries, ageing populations who are no longer working or soon will no longer be working, paying into the system uh, and being able to afford the relatively good life that most citizens have had and have assumed as a given for so long. We need people uh, to come in. What we haven't got is a differentiation. So we have political asylum seekers who have a, a certain amount of sympathy, although that is waning. We're seeing that with Ukrainians. We've long ago seen that with Syrians and Afghans and, and Iraqis as elsewhere. And then we have people who want, as you said in your introduction, a better life. Now, you could construct and you should construct a system, difficult though that may be, 
of better navigating that so people don't come on, on dangerous boats, they come on scheduled airlines in order to become doctors, uh, to become chefs, to become uh, nurses, um, accountants, all the things that we need uh, to, to fill our jobs and also to, to rejuvenate our societies because we also, in most places, have, have falling birth rates. So there's no differentiation and there's no strategy. What there is is almost overwhelming panic. Let's go to John Dalhusen. John, John Kampfner just said that there have to be strategies to make sure that people don't come via these boats. Now, the fact remains that the central Mediterranean route, that is considered the most dangerous uh, migratory route, and yet the number of people taking that route has gone manyfold. We've heard a few reasons, but why are people ready to take such risks? What are the reasons for that? I, mean, I, I think you've heard a number of them, them outlined already. I think it's also worth I mean, breaking down a little bit who is currently taking, taking that route. So in the last few years, a very large number of people, the significant reason for the spike has been an increase in Tunisians, Bangladeshis and, and Egyptians. These are all countries that are not producing large volumes of, of refugees. So that's one category. And, and, and these are overwhelmingly economic migrants. In the last year, uh, and, and responsible for the, the sudden spike that we've seen in the last few months and weeks on, on Lampedusa, is Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire. Now, that is a different category, a much higher category of, of uh, migrants who do go on to, to acquire refugee status. Uh, so there are definitely very different groups moving for, for very different for different reasons. Right, very different groups. Now, the central Mediterranean route ends at Lampedusa, an Italian island that only has a capacity to accommodate 500 migrants, according to the Italian Red Cross. But more than 5,000 refugees arrived there in just one day. They are exhausted and worn out. Many waited for months in North Africa to cross the Mediterranean to reach Europe. And then came disillusionment. The camps on Lampedusa are completely overcrowded. The situation in the center is not too good because it's too crowded. For, to get food, you can fight. If you don't fight, you don't have food. Even to take shower is a problem. Even cloth, problem. Because the population is too much. There are now more migrants than locals on Lampedusa. Many residents are angry. They fear that their island could become a permanent refugee hotspot. Our message is that Europe must wake up, because the European Union has been absent for 20 years. Today we are giving this signal. Lampedusa says enough. The people here have suffered long enough. We are psychologically destroyed. Is Lampedusa being used by the Maloney government to put pressure on the EU? John Kampfner, what do you think? Is Italy trying to pressurise the EU? Well, Georgia Maloney is um, a curious character coming into government on a sort of far-right or, or alt-right nativist populist platform. She, like most mainstream leaders, is struggling just as much as anybody else, not just to deal with numbers, and of course Italy and Greece are the two sort of most obvious points of arrival, or at least they have been up until now. She's struggling with the immediate arrivals, and she, like all other European leaders, is is struggling uh, for a strategy in, in knowing how to do it. So, yeah, I mean, it was important, and I think a, a short-term success of hers to get Ursula von der Leyen to come to Lampedusa um, a few days ago, to see that. There is, there is more focus on that. There is an internal European debate, part of the original Dublin Treaty that sort of set out mechanisms um, which uh, delineates whether the, the responsibility of the country of entry versus a dispersal of uh, asylum seekers and migrants um, across Europe. The problem is that a lot of uh, Central and Eastern European countries have not been playing ball, particularly famously in 2015 with Hungary and, and Austria. So Germany took in more than a million people famously then, and some countries are picking up more of the burden than others. And if countries like Germany, where, where we are here now, 
are getting increasingly hardball and getting increasingly frustrated because they're looking over their shoulders and they're seeing the AFD and, and, and other dangerous forces, then we've got a real problem. I would come to the distribution of uh, migrants in a bit. But, Carolina, we've heard who are the people coming. We've heard the reasons why they are coming. I'd like to understand how does this happen? Uh, 200 boats this week in Lampedusa. How was this even possible? Yes, and you asked a very good question also to John. Uh, how is it possible that those people are actually uh, capable of, of risking their own lives? But I, I, uh, uh, I thought... Uh, momentarily about those people who were trying to cross the Berlin Wall before 1989. I mean, they were also risking their lives and yet no, nothing could, could, could stop, stop them, them. From, from doing this. So I believe that this is very much connected with the, the, the organised crime which is behind all those boats uh, coming coming to Europe, to come to your other question. I think that what we are dealing here is a, a problem which is connected with uh, people's smugglers, and this is extremely, uh, extremely uh, important. On the other hand, we also have very little time. So John has started to talk about it. This is also uh, uh, um, something that can endanger our democracy, simply in the way that people are genuinely afraid of their uh, societies, of their environments changing in such a prompt pace. So what do they do? They often believe the populists. And then the populists are completely not the solution. Uh, there is the new book by Daniel Ziblatt and Steven Levitsky, uh, uh, the, the Tyranny of Minority. And they uh, describe a very interesting paradox, namely, never in history, in many countries, like European countries, but also the United States, we have uh, been so close to an ideal of a multicultural democracy functioning. And yet, in 2016, we have the first victory of Donald Trump, and yet, in 2016, we have Brexit. And yet, in 2015, we have the victory of law and justice in Poland. And everything, every and each of those campaigns were connected with exactly this argument. No more uh, migration. Mm -hmm. And of course, yet, they are not able to do anything about it. John, I think you wanted to pitch in. Well, I mean, it's just... You're absolutely right. And, and what is fascinating here, bringing it back to Germany just for a second, is that the Social Democrats and particularly the Greens are starting to talk in slightly different language because we're all looking ahead with some trepidation to European elections uh, early summer next year. Germany has three regional elections in the former Communist East in the autumn, all of them look like being democratic car crashes. Um, and we've got the Slovak elections very shortly. We have uh, uh, the Polish elections. Three weeks. In three weeks. Uh, it's, it, it looks like a very dangerous world in which the easy rhetoric of populism is exploiting what in football terminology you would call an open goal. The ground has been completely ceded by the mainstream democratic parties who are frightened to, of stepping onto this turf. Mm -hmm. Carolina just uh, mentioned, <coughs> you said, what are the solutions? Now, Ursula von der Leyen has announced a 10-point action plan. John Dalhusen, the action plan does look uh, solution-oriented. It also looks ambitious at the surface. But do you think it's realistic? It is a combination of the tried and failed and, and empty slogans. I mean, to refer back to, to, to what John was saying just now, the question in forthcoming elections, whenever it comes to migration, is who gets to present themselves as having a solution that, that is credible and that works? Uh, and the, the central problem at the moment is that the mainstream political establishment, the EU, doesn't appear to have any solutions that work at all. I mean, if, if you refer to this this 10 point plan, what's supposed to do anything? Uh, reform of uh, the, the European asylum system will change nothing. Increased, improved solidarity mechanism that no one wants to take part in. And that in any case, if it was implemented, Italy would have to take more people than it does now because it is underrepresented in terms of asylum seekers uh, at the moment. More Frontex border guards to sit at borders where the host country doesn't want them to be, or they have to turn their back, their eyes away from the pushbacks that are occurring. They're going to do. They're going to change nothing. 
deals with Tunisia, for instance, more deals with no concrete goals set out for the country that's supposed to, to implement them that result in more people coming and more human rights violations uh, occurring. More assistance to countries in Africa. The three countries in Africa got, got the most assistance from the EU's five billion in the last five years. There have been three coups in those countries, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and, and Niger, Burkina Faso, and, and Mali. That's not going to do anything. None of the elements of this 10-point plan will fundamentally change anything. In contrast, however, the leaders who get to look as if they have had solutions that work are all on the far right uh, or, or pretty close to the far right, whether that's piss in, in Poland saying we've closed a border, we unashamedly push people back and look, far fewer people are arriving. Orban gets to say, I've built fences, I've sealed off my country from anyone applying for asylum. How many people arrive? Nine. It works. Uh, the, the Salvini says, I got rid of rescue, ref, rescue boats in the Mediterranean. Numbers fell. It appears to work. Obviously, that wasn't <laughs> the fundamental cause of a reduction in numbers. But nonetheless, they get to present their solutions as solutions that work. Because indeed, pushbacks can and do work. The challenge for a mainstream political uh, establishment and parties is what do you present as an alternative to violence, cruelty and brutality at your borders and in transit countries that has the sine qua non of contemporary electoral politics of controlling borders? And this is what everyone's focus needs to, to, to be on, not, not fantasies of the kind that the EU uh, and von der Leyen is, is, is peddling. So, so no we can come on to those solutions in a, in a minute. So no concrete solutions from the politicians, but a lot of words. Well, we have indeed heard some strong words from both von der Leyen and Meloni this week. Let's take a quick listen to what they've said. We will decide who comes to the European Union and under what circumstances, and not the smugglers and traffickers. We are dealing with such a large number of migrant flows that we can only take action against illegal immigration together. Otherwise, the phenomenon will not only overwhelm countries with external borders, but all EU countries. Carolina, John Dalhusen has raised a lot of points. Now, would you say that the European distribution plan has completely failed? I would say that the public opinion is changing, and it is changing profoundly uh, throughout the European member states. Look, um, here in Germany, in 2015, a million of people have been welcomed. Now, after the start of the full-scale war uh, in Ukraine, this country has also uh, accepted hundreds of thousands of people from Ukraine, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, however, after those two last migrant crises, the German politicians uh, say more and more often, listen, wir schaffen das nicht mehr. We, 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 we will not, we cannot do it anymore, even if we have very good will. Now look at the Poland, Poland's political scene. A lot is being said about the current government and its uh, uh, policy of not opening borders and not welcoming even those quotas that were uh, in 2015 um, uh, decided by the European Union. But listen to the opposition. Listen to the opposition. Actually, they would not change the policy so much. Perhaps, this is very probable, they would oppose the situation in which on the Polish-Belarusian border we have people in the forests who actually starve to death and freeze to death. This is what they oppose very strongly. They believe that if someone has crossed the fence, they should be helped in a legal and uh, human way, uh, humanitarian way. But as for whether they will uh, uh, welcome more uh, more migrants, more refugees. I think what what is to be heard from the rhetoric of the police opposition is always or ever more in the direction of of uh, Denmark. So so either a, 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 a rational solution is 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 found, which will somehow pos be positioned between the constellation of factors. So. European values, humanitarian treating of, of newcoming refugees, international law. 
but also the fear, the collective fear of people who are afraid of their world changing. So either a re re reasonable but also pragmatic solution is found, or the populists will be winning in, um, in the European countries one after another. So if politicians are not able to change policy as of now, and smugglers are the ones deciding who will enter EU, has Europe lost control completely? It's losing control, and it's not just control of migration, but as we've already been discussing, it's losing control of the politics as well. And that is incredibly dangerous. And as I said before, there's, there's big picture stuff about we need a very grown-up debate about migration and demographics and what kind of society um, we all want to live in in each of our different countries with all the disagreements of that debate that that would entail. But there's also some very practical things and just a couple of quick stats um, uh, to, to add at this point. So in Germany alone, um, according to official stats, uh, currently 280,000 um, migrants have had their applications rejected. Um, they've gone through the process and they have been told they have to leave. In the first six months of 2023, fewer than 8,000 um, were uh, um, extradited, were sent out of the country. Now, the problem is that there, there is the wider question, but when systems are not working... I mean, in the UK, to cite another example, there's a very right-wing, shrill interior minister who's always um, uh, huffing and puffing about migration. But the system is broken. They can't even process applications. They can't um, uh, remove people when their applications are broken. So when systems, when the basic practicalities don't work, that adds a further dimension into these wider questions as well. You've mentioned the UK, so I'd like to go to John Dalhousen. Now, UK is talking about um, prison ships, UK is talking about sending people to Rwanda. That's not the most humane way to deal with the humanitarian crisis, is it? Um, well, not, not every aspect of, of this policy is, is humane, and there are many who disagree with every single aspect of it. Uh, but I think it's worth pausing to consider some of the elements that the UK has thrown into the debate and that others in Europe are, are also contemplating. So if you take a step back, th there are two ways in which you can seek to reduce irregular arrivals. One we've seen, and we've seen that it, it can work if you have the stomach for it, is cruelty. The other is agreements with other countries of origin, transit, and perhaps third countries altogether that you can legally send people back to, including asylum seekers, because everyone applies for asylum. Uh, and then, you know, what does legally mean? It means this has to be a country in which it is safe for them and they have access to a procedure. Could that country be Rwanda? Well, Possibly, possibly. In a very revealing Court of Appeal judgment in the UK a few months ago, the UK said, well, there's nothing in principle wrong with sending an asylum seeker to a third country. But in practice, does Rwanda deliver what is necessary? And it concluded no. But OK, there's the, the start of something that you can possibly work on here in Rwanda possibly in, in other countries. As it happens for the UK, there's a much better solution, a much easier solution to implement, which would be return to France. Very quick, very immediate return of people arriving to France. This requires a quid pro quo agreement with France, perhaps other EU countries, probably not with the, with the EU itself. Um, but the idea that, and, and this comes back to, to, to John's concern about returns, you can't transfer individuals to countries that don't want to cooperate with that return in any number. Uh, and this is why so few people are returned to, to, to Africa. If you want effective returns, return policy, you need agreements with these countries that are in their interest, that offer them something they want, quite possibly large amounts of legal mobility. This is what you'd need with many West African sub-Saharan countries. If you want to be able to return to reduce the spike in arrivals that we haven't discussed, but on the Greek islands, well, you need to look back at the, what is the one thing that has worked in the last six years. It was an agreement with Turkey in 2016. How does the EU resuscitate that 
in a way that encourages Turkey to take people back from Greece, including asylum seekers, but in a way that they are looked after well in Turkey, have access to an asylum procedure there, and that Turkey has an interest in, in, in respecting. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. Okay, we don't have time for more. Carolina, I'll give you the last word very quickly. Um, now, migration crisis is going to increase, especially because of climate change. Can there be a humane way to deal with it at all? Ten seconds. If there cannot be a humane way, are we still Europeans? John? It's to, as, absolutely. It comes down to what kind of societies do you want, what kind of societies can you afford, and what kind of societies can you sustain without there being social instability. Thank you. Whether Lampedusa or New York, Europe or the US, will there be a solution to this global migration crisis in the near future? What do you think about it? If you're watching us on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.